Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, those beyond and in between the binary, this podcast episode is scheduled for one and one half hour. It is episode four of Glow the Distance, a gorgeous ladies of wrestling podcast. Coming to the mixer first, hailing from Oakland, California, the anarcho karma chameleon, the editor of Guillotine Vogue, Jetta And her co-host, also hailing from Oakland, California, spitting an endless dissidence track on your trumped-up chump style, she's the clap-back flapper in a compromat lipstick, Lauren Parker! Well, let me tell you something, Lauren. I'm glad to be here with you today. I'm glad to be here with you. We are sick as dogs. Yeah, yeah, we are we are, we are sick. You gave me a a lovely diversified stock portfolio. You know, <laughs> like it you gave me like a seed money of of a cold and then over a week I was able to di- divest, I don't know. Yeah, this started off as like a, you know, like a meta like it met- metastasized. Like there's really yeah. there's no other way to put it. <laughs> Please don't yeah. die during this recording. <laughs> well, if we do, we, you're there. Carry us <laughs> along. Welcome to Glow the Distance, Thank you. a gorgeous ladies of wrestling podcast in which I, a wrestling Luddite who doesn't really understand what wrestling is, and an overall wrestling widow, am kind of taken by the hand and made a champion in the ring. Yes. So our guest today uh, for episode four, in which we cover episode four of Glow, is my friend uh, Chelsea Spallen from the podcast Shoulders Up. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me. How are you doing today? <laughs> Pretty good. I uh, I had therapy, and I went to Midtown Comics and bought some comics that I'm going to give to my friend tomorrow. So it was a pretty successful day. Yeah, that sounds great. Yep. So, Chelsea, tell me, I, I have one question, and it's sort of the same question for everyone, so I'm sorry for it being a little tedious, but what is wrestling? What is wrestling? Wrestling, it is a medium, not a genre. I really like the the phrasing Nikki Bella used once where it's Broadway with body slams. It's theater, but told using the tools of interpretive dance, basically, to make fictional fights. That tell awesome. stories. Yeah, I love I love that. That's a really really good perspective. Um, and that, and as a Broadway baby, that's like kind of the only way that I can like envision it. Oh, okay. So it pays actors about as well as like you know acting does. Yeah, I mean, unless you work for the majors, you know, unless right. you like work in Hollywood and everybody knows who you are. Broadway is slightly more union friendly. <laughs> oh God, that's dark true. laughter. Yeah, people who work on Broadway probably have health insurance, like some of them. Uh, we would like to say that we do have one entirely like designated "We Hate Hulk Hogan" thread. If you have any feelings about Hulk Hogan as a union buster, I kindly direct you to there. We'd be more than happy to rant with you. I don't like Hulk Hogan either. <laughs> How can you? <laughs> anyway, so um, to start the show off, we're going to do what we call the wrestling fan news uh, minute, where. Um, Chelsea and I will sort of quick fire talk about the things that are happening in the news that, you know, excite, move, compel us, and um, Lauren will take a sip of tea. All right, so today's the 33rd anniversary of Black Saturday. Um, it is, um, so a long time ago, there were only two companies that had access to cable uh, in wrestling, and one of them was WWF, and the other one was Georgia Championship Wrestling. And Vince McMahon really, really, really wanted to have cable access, so he bought the majority of shares in Georgia Championship Wrestling secretly, and then broadcasted, like, his own show in that time slot without announcing it beforehand. And it's sort of considered, like, one of these, like, dark days, like the, the harbingers of the eventual monopoly that WWF would be. Become. Sort of depressing, but also fascinating. So, um, so wrestling news that I'm really uh, enthused about: uh, the May Young Classic. The first day of it happened yesterday, and I think the second day is today. Um, and oh my God, so many talented, amazing women wrestlers! Oh my God, me, Yim, and Candice LeRae got announced at the last minute, and I'm so excited about it. And Alpha Female got a uh, sign her chance yesterday, and oh my God, I love her. And uh, Kimberly is in it, although she's Abby Leif now, and I love her. And She's amazing. And Kyrie Hojo is here, and that means that I'm going to spend a lot of money on wrestling tickets. 
and just generally I'm really excited to see her and they let her keep the elbow drop. Sorry for the spoiler there. And uh, the other wrestling news I'm really kind of worked up about is that Talking Smack got canceled. So Talking Smack was a show that would happen after SmackDown that was a shoot. So it was all of the like the hosts and all the guests that would come on were not in character. Okay. And so they would often have, you know, what we would well, call... They were sort of in character, but they were in character, but they weren't scripted the way that they normally are. They normally, like when they're being interviewed, they have a script that they have to read from Mm -hmm. and follow. And on Talking Smack, they didn't do that. Okay, but they were still largely in character. Kind of, okay. most of the time. Okay. A famous example of like something that happened on Talking Smack is that Daniel Bryan, who's this like retired indie wrestler who works for WWE now, like got into this fight, like this argument with The Miz, who is a wrestler right now. Daniel Bryan accused him of being soft and like having a soft, safe style. And The Miz was like, well, fuck you. Like, I'm not crippled. <laughs> Uh, there's no gentle way to say it to me. You wrestle like a coward. Yeah. I'm the coward. Wait, let me tell you about a coward. Let me tell you about a guy who tells his WWE fans, the people that he loves, that he will be back. He promises them. I promise you, I will be back in one year's time to claim this title. But you didn't, Daniel, did you? But I'm the coward. And that was like, uh, that, that, that kind of like set the, the tone for that show. It set the tone for Talking Smack, and it set the tone for what happened on SmackDown for the next like six months and a lot of the stuff that happened on smackdown after that was really really good and so people watched talking smack and they were really excited about it like there were jokes like oh that two-hour show they run before talking smack is kind of good right (laughs) it was very entertaining and it was very it felt very authentic in this very like glossy overproduced wwe product that we have right now all right phenomenal does that conclude the wrestling fan news Yes, and now we move to um, Progressive Caveat, where we all take a moment to just sort of process what we find problematic about this episode. Quick interjection. We We would like to do a shout-out to our producer, Paul Sauer. All right, let's carry on with Progressive News Caveat. The show's got, the show's got some shit we've got to discuss. Some Progressive Caveats. For your praxis. Okay, so progressive news caveat. I think that we're really starting to kind of see the, the in, in some ways this is very good. We get to see the damage that kind of these racial, st- racial stereotypes and, and sexual stereotypes are kind of having an impact of these performers. And they really are kind of over a barrel here. They don't have a lot of control. And you see this incredibly gentle and beautiful scene where Welfare Queen comes to Sam and says, I don't, I don't like this. And he's just like, hey, it's fine, get over it. And it was really hard for me to watch the first 900 times I've watched it. <laughs> we, we see like a little bit more sexual objectification now that we've got people interacting. It's almost like there's, there's so many people that we've got to kind of reduce them to their like non-character names. They've got the character names, but then really we're going to know them by their wrestling names, which essentially means that we're calling you know, women racial stereotypes the entire season. It's uh, disappointing. At first it kind of bothered me that like all of these like legitimate wrestlers... Uh, other than Kia Stevens, we're only getting like very, very bit parts. And at first that rough, ruffled my feathers as a fan, but then I was like, no, that's, that's great. This is the point <laughs> like okay. of the show. Like, and then I had this like moment where I was like, oh yeah, like this is internalized misogyny where I'm, I'm, I'm getting like more bristly that Carlito only got like two lines in the whole, in, in this episode, you know, whereas then, then like, we are about Jenny. Yeah. Uh, my gripe is that I had to use Wikipedia and IMDb to remember the names of a lot of the characters who are sort of like the background women of color yeah. on the show. And that's really frustrating because oh, because I think that part of it, it's not necessarily like included in all the marketing that they did about the show, but it's kind of like an understood feature of you should watch Glow because it's more progressive than most other shows, you know? And, like, I think that they don't do enough to earn that distinction. Like, if you're going to give me all these cool women of color characters, they should be important enough that people say their names more often than just, like, once every couple of episodes. And to tag onto that, like, Ruth having an identity crisis, as much as Auntie Christ was a hilarious pun, and I do think that people that hand out raisins to kids on (laughs) Halloween should be penalized in a court of law... (laughs) We didn't really need that. <laughs> like, her existential crisis is not, like, the thing that I relate to. Right. It's, like, the least relatable thing. Like, you've got 
you've got Kate Nash living in her fucking car. And she's but she's just like funny and sexy. I'm like, she's living in her car. And Ruth's and fine. Ru- like I relate to Ruth sometimes in that she's very precious about her art. Yeah. And that's a middle class white girl thing and I'm a middle class white girl, so I can like I can relate to that. I'm also an artist, so I can relate to that. But I also sometimes she talks and I want to punch her in the face. And you're supposed to kind of want to punch her in the face, but I feel like she does take up so much time that should be being we, used. We've wanted to, tell to punch her for like a long time now. It's yes. it's getting like it's getting tedious. Like we get it. She's Piper. Yes. Yes. Wait, Thank you. Is that a orange is the new black. Oh, is oh, oh, that's oh, not okay. like a revolutionary comparison. That's basically like, hot take. Yeah. That's like what everything piece is about is that Ruth is, you know, the fucking Piper of the show. And she is. Um, until yeah, until she shows us differently, that's where, where I'm at with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, she's the most annoying character on the show, and she's the one that sometimes makes you want to turn it off. It's frustrating to listen to her yeah. bitch about her life. Okay, so we're now going to go into our lit recap. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, sponsored this time by Ace California Pineapple Hard Cider. It's really good. It's uh, It's tart but not bitter. It's actually helping my sore throat a little bit. It's quite nice. Um, and it's gluten-free for those of you who um, who care about that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Because cider is made from juice. You learn something new every day. We're going to learn a lot of things today that we <laughs> may, we needn't have. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things in this episode that I, didn't, I walked away knowing that I had not known pre- previously. So I'm going to put my, my cider far away because we're about to get like the, the, like the beginning of this episode is like gross and like gag worthy. So we, we start the episode with seeing <laughs> Sheila. I put pre wolfed. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a waning moon. <laughs> yeah. Doing her makeup. And she's doing it to um the Dream Academy song Life in a Northern Northern Town, which is like a really weird song choice. It's very eighties. I love that song. But it's a weird song choice. I just wanted to introduce um, on that. And so, and, and so we actually see what she looks like underneath her wig. She's actually got, like, a Ninochka, like, Bridget Nielsen. She's got, like, an Uni Linux she, Yeah, she's got, on. like, a cute, like, peroxide uh, pixie cut, which, I, which, I, which I'm going to talk about later, uh, which I find is sort of strange and incongruous. But So her makeup routine involves smudge eyeliner. So she actually sets fire. She actually, like, burns. That's old school. That's old school coal makeup. That's, like, 1950s. Oh, really? Okay. Like, so what you would do... I was impressed, a, actually. Yeah, you, we, it's not normally that something that you do with pencils, but you, you normally would get kind of basically like a brick of it and uh-huh. melt it and then after it was liquid but I guess I presume not so liquid you would burn your face right off. Um, I don't know if that was like a big part of puberty in the 1950s um, <laughs> but that was how you would kind of get like that 1960s look see I wear smudged eyeliner as like my preferred makeup thing but like they just make the eyeliner that's like on one end is the pencil and the other end is the eraser that lets you smudge, yeah, it. smudge like, it yeah, yeah. So she puts on a smudged eyeliner, uh, also smudged mascara, which was my favorite part. Is just she just like <laughs> just like rolls it around and like smears it, and then this was awful. This was so bad. <laughs> she puts green yellow nail polish on her teeth, which are so gross. Which are white otherwise, which I guess she takes off at night. <sighs> How? I, like I have never put acetone in my mouth, uh, but I don't think that's good for teeth. Okay, once upon a time I'm. Okay. All right. Hit me. All right. I occasionally buy lipstick from Jeffree Star. He is a not so great man who makes very good makeup. I apologize. But uh, the the makeup smells like Jolly Rancher. And so I decided that maybe it tastes like it too and stuck the whole wand in my mouth and it didn't. And that's like, that did not taste like Dolly Rancher. It tasted quite terrible. And that's what I imagine that this is like, except for way longer. Would, would putting lacquer on your teeth make them like a little stronger? <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> stronger like doesn't enamel need to breathe isn't that a thing maybe well, I, I made mean, that up in my head i imagine like so teeth are wet even if you dry them they're still wet like how long would it take for that to dry it's not like nails dry quickly and those are the driest things on the planet like none of this this does this doesn't check out thank goodness yeah <laughs> yeah thank yeah so okay so she does that and she just like she looks in the mirror and she like exhales with this, like, relief and a hint of, like, self-recognition, which I immediately grokked, as they say. There was this, for me, this, like, ah, trans narrative. That's what we're going with. I, this is yeah, that episode. I definitely kind of felt like there was a bit of an other kin component to this. Like, that was definitely supposed to be, like, a performance of, all, you know, of alternative presence that is, in mm-hmm. some ways, confrontational, but often is kind of really about the self. But also, yuck. Yeah, <laughs> so um, the next scene is uh, is Bash and Sam 
I, I, I do want to say before we go forward, like this is like the first episode where we really start getting like multiple subplots. Agreed. Like interwoven. Yep. So Bash about time. Ba- yeah, Bash and Sam arrived at the gym together. Okay, hold on. So Debbie and Ruth still fucking hate each other four episodes in, but like Bash and Sam just had a blow up and are already like in the swing of a bromance. Look, where I come from, throwing a drink in a robot's face meant something. Yeah, I mean, you've never gone and recuperated via some sort of therapy outlet involving a lot of cocaine in Palm Springs. That is that is true. It's the opposite of Betty Ford, but have we considered it? <laughs> is it like a like a men repre- repress their feelings and they just are like, well, I'm going to punch you and then have a beer and then it's fine even though it's not fine. Yeah, and then they die of cancer at 60. Yeah, <laughs> that is how that works. <laughs> That's kind of how that goes. So they, 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 they tell Debbie that they went to Palm Springs together. <laughs> uh, they describe, uh, Bash describes as mentally, we were on a magic carpet ride. Um, Bash is so, like, high enthusiasm, and Sam is just, like, he constantly is just like, we just did, like, he's a realist, but he's no fun about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so then Bash and Sam both try, fail to open the stroller. <laughs> So, so yeah, like... Okay, wait, wait, wait. Sam does not even really try. No, no, he does that thing that, like, we've all done it at some point where he keeps, like, lurching forward and then yeah. stopping himself from helping. But, yeah, so Sam... So Bash can't open uh, a stroller. And then as they walk away, Sam says that he was afraid of offending Debbie. I am woman, hear me roar, right? So Helen Reddy's I Am Woman was released in 1971. So I feel like if this show takes place in 1987, which is, as we've covered in episode one, my theory, my, my head canon. This is like a weird middle ground where like Sam, it's not a colloquial slogan. So I don't know if like, no, it, it is, is it? It's, it's not ex- a timing thing. It's definitely a big thing, especially for second wave post, like, you know, okay. clip, yeah. where it was like, you know, th- this song was very, very iconic for that. And it had like a very long range. And if he was a, you know, small time, big time director in the seventies, okay. it would have come up, especially since I'm sure that he has blamed every single wife leaving him on women's lips. Okay. Yeah. See, I thought idiot. that this was him trying to like relate to the youth and failing no, by I having like a, a reference. <laughs> I that's think like, it's the opposite of hello, fellow kids. Okay. Okay. Well, see, uh, and we'll talk about this kind of uh, later and in other episodes, but like, um, up until like the last like ten years or so, WWF, WWE, and like Vince McMahon, they have had a problem where they like only recognize trends like two or three years after they happen, um, and a lot of wrestlers kind of get like l- like laden with these like shit gimmicks. I like, think it would also have been re like bolstered by like movies like Working Girl and Nine to Five. Like they would have right, been right, right, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So. Um, <laughs> So they just walk into the gym, um, and Debbie leaves. Uh, Debbie goes, they leave her in the parking lot. And then so they, they gather the ladies together, and Bash tells them they were locked in a hotel room together for 24 hours. Separate rooms, for the record, uh, says says Mark Marin. Um, and they did a no ton homo. of homo. <laughs> they did a ton of cocaine. Uh, and uh, Sam's like, cloistering yourself up so like if some 17th century monk makes you way more fucking productive and helps you focus. Um, I'm not convinced that that's very different from Sam's regular routine. What I love about that moment is, um, I don't know if either of you saw me post it on Twitter, but like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, when he says that, the camera, that, that when that, when that uh, uh, caption <laughs> comes up, it goes to Debbie, who's like, has a shoulderless top. And like and a baby bro- and the and, and the stroller she had to open by herself yeah and like and and the biggest like the bluest fuck me eye shadow and she just like looks off like with her eyes closed to the side and it's very it's very mood so uh, they inform everyone that they're going to move into a hotel for five weeks to sort of speed up the process of getting them ready for the show and it's not optional. There's going to be a curfew and no drugs and yeah. So all of the things that probably facilitated this like this stupid idea of theirs is like now been eliminated. Is it, yeah, and it's, right. Sam Sam <laughs> explains his reasoning by saying like most of you don't know how to act. None of you can wrestle. And like this is like the first time in the series the show is actually like legitimately concerned take, about take, that. Yeah, taking pity for Ruth. Like it kind of lingers on her having this like wait was that like a backhanded compliment? Yeah, I mean like Sam is sort of. I, I, he's a person that is trying to get negging down and fails at it. <laughs> like, when I heard him say that uh, the first time I watched it, I tweeted about it. I was like, is he <laughs> describing the plot of the show or is he talking about the Divas era of WWE? And it got a whole bunch of retweets because, yeah, that was what happened. Yeah. So we get a montage of the ladies packing up over Moving Out, Anthony's song by Billy Joel. Which, which was a really lovely, like, little, like, I mean, again, that's another 70s song. There's a lot of, like, throwback. I think um, Dream Academy is also early 80s. But it was just, like, such, such a perfect yeah. city. Billy Joel has, has been <laughs> rehabbed a bit 
like my dad was really into Billy Joel when I was young, and and so like for reasons like I wasn't really into him. But Das Racist sampled his song, this song in their in their song "You Ought to Know," and that helped kind of rehabilitate this song. Well, I mean, after River me. of Dreams, he had a lot to dig himself out of. So Ruth has a giant poster of Audrey Hepburn. Uh, as if she like could she make herself more odious to us? Like could. Could she possibly be more white and basic? <laughs> yeah, she's like, oh, she's a brunette. Like, she's kind of got that Jan from Three's Company thing going on where I'm like, I'm diversity. And it's like, how are you younger than me and know, like, all the shit, like... This? You're not going to like the answer to this. Okay. I watched a lot of VH1. I love the 70s and 80s. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, um, so Carmen makes a dummy of herself out of pillows in her bedroom. And she puts the little shoes on. <laughs> yeah. It's so cute. Like, she's just like, oh, this is fine. And and here we learn that Britannica <laughs> has been living out of her car. And um, it's still, like, cheerful and, like, Yeah, lovely. and that she had parked her car, her house, in a, um, at a parking meter and then had put a phony meters broken sign. Which is not the way to do it now. I but wish you, that strategy worked in New York. No, what you do is you put a bag over it, like a plastic bag. You put bag. a bag over it? Yeah, because it's what police do when they mark that a meter is broken. So you put oh. a plastic bag over it. Like, they'd have to go and check every single broken meter, which they're not going to do because that's why there's so many broken meters. I didn't tell you this. You heard this from somebody else who sounds eerily like me. Anyway. So, Jenny steals her mother's jewelry while she sleeps. That's t- like, you see the stakes here. You get to see, like, what these people... Like, Carmen is putting her shoes in. Like, Britannica is like, oh, this is like, I get to finally leave my car. And Ruth is Ruth. <laughs> I have to say that, like, that moment was hard. Because, like, I... I don't know. When I was young, my mom once thought I took five bucks out of her purse, and like I, I'm 31, and like decades later, I still sometimes feel really bad about that. And like I kind of like ah, I know that like your whole story arc is supposed to be about like how you've been wronged by society. You, you tingled me, and <laughs> I mean, trust me, she's gonna get punished for it later. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> like she, like I don't mean in a literal way, but like in like a metaphorical. The world is never on her side. Oh, way. okay, okay. So, I'm sorry that I, I keep making everything about fucking social justice. I'll stop. Okay. <laughs> more drink, more drink. Um, so Cherry and her husband make love. I specifically wrote make love and not have sex because I don't. It just looks too straight and too. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I never use that word. I like I uh, fuck having sex do it. I'm laughing because I agree with you. Like if I was gonna if I was gonna write about that segment, I would have said I was like, oh, they were fucking. Well, you know? yeah, like it was definitely supposed to be like them getting like their kicks in, but then he comes with her. Which Who, was, yeah, which yeah. Right. Who makes eye contact and smiles during sex? Who leaves their eyes? People open on TV. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So so um, Arthi says goodbye to her grandmother who doesn't even look away from uh, watching WWE Superstars uh, while she points to a pair of Dabas for Arthur to take. And I, I made a lot of notes on this because I, I really love uh, love food stuff. So <clears throat> so the thing that um, the, the two things that uh, Arthur takes are called Dabas, and they're a type of Indian uh, lunchbox. It's kind of like metal stackable bentos. Um, in India, there's these courier systems <laughs> where... Every day, there's you know a messenger comes to your house while your husband or, or breadwinner is out at work, and you give them a <laughs> daba, and and they take, collect all the dabas in the neighborhood, and they put them on a train. They take them to work. They're then given to you know the spouse or, or breadwinner or whatever, and then they eat it, and then they send it back, and they're re-delivered at the end, like at the end of the afternoon, so that they can be washed and redone. And, and these are um, these are called Daba Wallas. There's actually a pretty famous uh, film, Indian film, called the, um, the Lunchbox, which is uh, about this about the system um, and like a, a pen pal relationship that comes out of it. I just I love I love I love food stuff and history stuff. Ruth goes through her fridge and eats all of her leftovers, and uh, she—I guess she's drinking Franzi. I know she tips like the end of her like water into a glass. No, it's a box. It's, no, I know. I think that's for water. I really? Know that's Franzia. Really? Yeah, I read that as water. Um, which is sort of like she's got this apartment. Like in comparison, it's just like she's fine. Like she's not. She's like going through like takeout, and she's like trying to figure out. And she's still got kind of like that like you know plucky young. I'm gonna make this work thing. But when you compare right. it to like kind of like the real struggles of everybody else, you're just sort of like compared yeah. to living in your fucking car. Like her apartment is a palace. Like her apartment is literally like it's nicer furnished. Than There's the no like empty I'm rooms sitting. or anything. Like you her know, her apartment is nicer than the apartment I'm sitting in right now. Yeah. There's uh, I. 
Netflix does this all the time. They do it on every show. Everybody. The million dollar Netflix apartment. Show, yeah. Has such a nice apartment. Like, what the fuck? Except for Stranger Things. That house was a genuine shithole. Okay, but I mean. But that is an exception. <laughs> so the hotel is yeah. called the, the Dusty Spur, which I did not notice until I watched it the last time. I was like, oh, okay. That's where the title comes from. Uh, Chelsea, you have some thoughts about this? Oh, just I popped for it because I, I assumed it was a Dusty Rhodes show. There is no honor among thieves in the first place. He put hard times on Dusty Rhodes and his family. Uh, I just, I um, Lauren does not know what popping means or who Dusty Rhodes is. Popping is like when you're excited about something in wrestling and you go, yay. Okay, I got that. Yep. I can learn things. Um, and, and uh, Dusty Rhodes is one of the most successful professional wrestlers. Um, he's like universally beloved. Um, he just passed away last year. I, I remember. Year before. I remember the crying. Yeah. Yep. As, as so called out right now. No, I mean, like as a wrestling widow, a lot of it is me watching Jetta's feet going, "What's happening right now?" And then all I know is that Jetta was very, very heartbroken. It was. Like, it was pretty an sad. Thing. Um, like if Triple H died, in which case it would not be. You got. I remember you got very mad at him during uh, what China's memorial. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, th- there's there's a lot of very valid and good reasons to be mad at Triple H, but Dusty Rhodes was not like that. He was a lot of people who worked with him had really lovely things to say about him. People who were his peers, and also a lot of modern wrestling fans kind of know him as like he worked in the WWE Performance Center with a lot of the younger talent and everybody who he worked with in that capacity says like he changed the person that I am. He made me a better wrestler. He's the reason I'm successful. Like he had a lot of really amazing creative instincts and gave a lot to the business. So I, I assumed that anything in a wrestling show that was dusty was probably a dusty road. So question, is he the one that like when people impersonate him, they go, Oh yeah. No, it's Macho Man. No, no, a a dusty (laughs) impression is, um, is a lisp with a bit of like, uh, with like, a bit of like appropriated AV, AAVE. Okay. So like a dusty impression, if you will. Okay. I make your back crack and your liver quiver. Okay. I'm not even going to try to do it myself. I can't. That's that awesome. was pretty good, Jetta. Thank you. So Carmen is so, so happy and she is, I think, the guiding light to our general hospital. She is so sweet and gorgeous and Sheila is like fucking not into this because she's roomed with Ruth. So Carmen is, is paired up with Kate Nash or Britannica or Godiva. I literally don't know what her real character is. This is a problem. Um, and Sheila is paired with Ruth. And like, so everybody kind of has like names based on like their character names. So it's Sheila the She-Wolf, Machu Picchu, but Ruth is just Ruth. So there's kind of like this, this further ostracism in the narrative. Sheila basically shows up with a medieval chest because goth kids are on brand. <laughs> She ends up staying with Ruth, who shows uh, her a new idea for a gimmick, which is kind of a female JR with a touch of Corella. De- it's a terrible idea. She's just like talking about like, it's a very distinct class issue. Like she's like, oh, I'm going to, you know, be evil and sell stocks. And I'm like, this is the sort of thing that a socialist would do because they think it was funny. And it would totally misfire. The I mean, audience. it would have gotten over like the evil millionaire. That's yeah. like, especially in the mid 80s, like. They could have gotten over. She uh, wasn't an evil everything. millionaire, yeah. but an evil female millionaire. Oh, yeah. Like, wrestling fans in the 80s fucking loved to have a woman that they were supposed to hate. I mean, they do now, but there was a there was a particular relish in the misogyny of wrestling fans. In yeah. I mean, you remember you remember when we watched Major League? Yeah. Like, and how, and how the, like, the woman millionaire was, like, the villain. Like, there's, there's this, like, trope of the, like, the female millionaire ruining the, you know, the good old time of of men. It's kind of a variation on Welfare Queen, to be totally honest, where it's like this evil millionaire woman comes in and steals all this alimony, as if that's how that works. <laughs> there's a weird, there's like a weird connection, and I don't like it, and you should all feel bad. <laughs> so Ruth tries to confide in Sheila, who is not interested in having a roommate, and is not interested in being Ruth's friend, and does a very good job of drawing boundaries, and Ruth does a very good no- job at ignoring them. No, I'm not okay with this either. Ruth tells her that she respects how committed that she is to the characters of Sheila. Sheila does the, ah, uh, this again face. Uh, because and I've seen, like, I've done that face, and I've seen that face so often yeah. when someone wants to, like, talk to you about your identity, and they don't realize that they are... Oh, tell me, like, how hard it is to be an X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, oh. Okay. Um, so she tries explaining that this is not a character. 
Uh, and Ruth digs in deeper, but in a very rude way, asking if Sheila would be interested in helping her do the method all the time approach to develop a persona. Again, it's super insulting. Yeah. So the 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 professor, the the shack on Machu Picchu, <laughs> professor from the last episode. That was why he basically like hounded me like that whole semester to try and get me to detransition. Is he thought that I was. Like, was playing? Yeah, he thought that I was like living as a woman, basically, to develop the character of being a woman. Why the fuck would anybody do that? Because people don't like trans people. Too. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I know that. I'm saying why Why would, from his perspective, like, I just, there's no way to rationalize that. I well, mean, so sorry. to be honest... Getting on- angry on your behalf. <laughs> well, so to be honest, so I, I was in art school at the time, and... There's this thing that happens where, like, a lot of trans women kind of overperform masculinity yeah. as a, you know, and so, like, for a lot, a lot of people did think when I came out that it was either an art project or a joke because I was, you know, I was tall, I was muscular, like, I had long hair, but I also had a beard and I wore metal shirts and, you know, I cross, you know, I quote cross dressed a lot in, in high school, but I stopped doing that in college. Um, so, you know, a lot of people just saw, saw me as like someone, they saw me fronting basically. And they just like assumed that like, you know, I was just that, that in a way that like living as a woman was this, uh, it was this like extension of that fronting of like, ah, I'm so masculine that I'm going to wear a dress just to show that I'm, you know, a, a man and, 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 and impervious to, to feelings or authenticity. I think there's also kind of, and I see this in, in other forms and it's not quite, offensive in the same particular way but there's this idea that if you don't participate in whatever perspective that somebody has on gender that somehow you are like repressed or participating in your own oppression and there's a lot of like generally cis dudes running around really trying to save women um from hegemony and i would like them to stop uh and i think this is the case of that where it's like yeah. oh just be yourself and it's like i am no the self of you that i kind of would feel more comfortable with yeah be yourself be the person you would be if you were locked in a cave in yeah, uh that's it yeah if, so you, if you were, yeah if you were locked in a cave in peru yeah, for you, uh, for you, a year and had and then and then emerged like caked in mud if you never had to be employed and you never had to deal with anyone else be that person that's the real you eat that way that's why that's what paleo is <laughs> yeah like. yeah Carmen and Britannica are rooming together, <laughs> and while talking about her p- experiences with poverty, yeah, like Britannica is like telling Carmen about like how she hasn't slept in a bed in forever, and she once walked like the length of Santa Monica Boulevard asking cute boys for a dollar. Like she takes off her top and shows her tits, and like Carmen is staring <laughs> at her tits. Which, like, if you've been changing in a car, yeah, it's pretty like probably pretty typical, and I also a very normal that. thing for I, I think homosocial friendships amongst women. Like we like there is sort of like this weird like special privacy where we all get together at summer camp and compare nipples. Maybe that's just me. <laughs> no. I mean, there's like there's an understanding that like you can change with another girl in the room. Yeah, and it doesn't mean you're coming on to her, and it's not a big deal. And maybe maybe if she has a cute bra on, you could say, "Oh, that's really cute. Where'd you get that?" Yeah, there's definitely like f- femininity affirmations. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And 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 Britannica kind of calls Carmen out on staring on her tits, and Carmen's like, "Yeah, I was. I've very gently. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen another woman's tits before, and I've never lived with uh, you know another woman." And, and she says, uh, "So I'm probably going to stare a lot because you're you're an alien." And she says it in kind of this gentle, like giving way. And, and it, is, it is definitely a way in which, like, if a man said that to me, I'd be like, "No, un- unacceptable." But like the way she says it, she's just like, "This is really strange for me." I might stare sometimes because I don't really get femininity. And Britannic is like, okay. And like puts lotion on with her. She's like, okay, well, every night I put on lotion. And then she says some things about lotion that aren't true. Um, <laughs> she's just like, you want to put on with me? And like shows her how to do it. There's like, there's this whole demonstration of a femininity that's really tender and sweet. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it also, it elicited, it elicited a lot of gender and sex feels just because like it, in a way it felt like Britannica is teaching Carmen how to be a woman, Yeah, which, you know, it's, Weird, weird gender feels for me, but also, like, we, we, we are not born, we are made, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, on the one hand, it's like, that can be really, really damaging. But if you're going to be a femme, there are certain, like, bullet points you have to do for, for femhood, and it's like, I've, I've definitely done this in life. I mean, you generally have to, you know, being asked, but it's like, okay, how do you pull this off? And I'm like, well, you have to pluck your eyebrows. What did you, how did you feel about this? Chelsea. My read on this wasn't just that Carmen was like, oh my god, um, I've never been around another woman before in this capacity, this is weird. It was also that, like, Carmen is uh, having queer feels, and 
Um, I've been the confused fat girl who secretly <laughs> wanted to explore with the hot straight girl who I realized on some level was just trying to be nice to me and wasn't interested in me that way. And like, it's so hard, that, to, it's so hard to know. That was a, that was a painful little like thing, but it also made me like, personally, I really connected to Carmen when she had that moment. And like, I forget the name of the actress, but she does a really nice job in that scene. Like she's really sweet and curious but not too curious like that's a fine <laughs> tightrope or fine line for someone to walk i think you know lauren you just found something out about the actress that plays yes, carmen her name is Brittany young and she is a former cheerleader is she really <laughs> it'll ask that's adorable yeah she's no she, there's nothing that she can do that isn't precious and delightful yeah it's so frustrating Actually, no, it's great. It's the only thing that's getting me through because it's like she's the counterbalance to fucking Ruth and her fucking poison. Like, oh my god. So, okay, so speaking of Ruth and poison, so the next scene is literally Ruth going to the bathroom in the middle of the night and rummaging through Sheila's makeup kit. Yeah, it's super rude. Also, um, I don't know what she picked up that was supposed to be like gummy or whatever. I think, no, I think it's supposed to be like beef jerky or like dehydrated meat. Oh, okay. Maybe what she- did you think it was? I assumed it was like dehydrated meat, but it didn't seem to me like it was pre-packaged that way i don't know i wasn't certain if it was like man-made dehydrated meat or if it was like some sort of like homemade concoction yeah she like took the entrails down from in front of the fireplace yeah it was kind of (laughs) gross it was very williamsburg (laughs) so 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 then so then ruth is tiptoeing back to bed and uh (coughs) sheila's awoken by something outside (laughs) and the captions say Pipes outside. So either they meant a car horn, and whoever did the captions has never heard of what a car horn, like, uh, does not know that cars have horns, or that there's just this guy outside the motel playing calliope music at three in the morning. Actually, like, Peruvian pipe music would wake you up. As somebody who's been to Boston where they are everywhere, it's just like... That's true. So Sheila wakes up, and we see that it's a wig. Ruth sees that it's a wig. We know it's a wig, but... So uh, her wig has come off. And she was just like, no, 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 like anxiously trying to fix it. And Ruth keeps trying to point out that it's okay, it's all right, you know, it doesn't have to be weird. And this just, like, makes Sheila angrier. Well, I think it's also, like, a white feminism moment. It's okay, you're safe with me, it's okay. But she's clearly not. Yeah. Uh, You were just going through her fucking makeup, like. Yeah, you're not safe. You think that you will not listen to her. You will not listen to, like, what her deal is. And you're confronted with her, like, you know, the, the disassociation of the internet, like, whatever. But, like, you, you, this is a person that's in your, that you're sharing a room with, and you didn't have the decency to mind your own fucking business. I mean, yeah, and also, I mean, there's this thing where, like, people feel like if they believe that they are not judgmental, that they are safe. But it's actually, it's because you believe that you aren't judgmental that you are unsafe. Absolutely. So, so Sheila yells at her and ple- basically pleads with her to stop looking, and then... Yeah, she doesn't threaten her. She actually does it in her, like, a really vulnerable way. Yeah. Please stop. Please stop. Uh, I was surprised by that. Like, I was I was actually really shocked that she was, like, begging. I'm going I to guess that Sheila's she probably not recently ripped someone's throat out with her teeth. <laughs> Maybe she's just sort of, like, coming into her own a little bit. But, yeah, I'm going to guess that that was part of it. Well, you, can't, you can't rip someone out with your teeth. That'll chip your tooth polish. Well, this is true. <laughs> So now we get the obligatory everyone's sun tanning scene. Yeah. Um, which is great because uh, we, we immediately get Sam like being confronted for the first time seriously about the racism of the characters where where Jenny, I am not ever referring to her by her, her Hor- character her name. Her horrible, her horrible um, context. No. Yeah. yeah. She's um, so yeah, so like she, you know, I'm, I'm, sun- I'm working on my tan, or at least fortune cookie is. That's the stereotype you, stereotype you want me to roll with, right? Asians work really hard, but we're also, we also do karate and are really shy. <laughs> I feel certain in my gut that Mia Yim had to explain this 101 shit to TNA at some point when she was working for them. Do you like, think I just that, like, know it. Do you think she just, like, at any point, like, could just, like, crouch down and kind of barrel into, like, Mark Marin? <laughs> like... You mean could she beat the crap out of Mark Marin? I mean, yeah, it that would be take awesome. Much he's a he's <laughs> he doesn't look like he, he works. Pretty out. breakable. Yeah, there's a fragility there. So Arthi shows off a front flip cannonball. It's and, beautiful, and she says it's going to be Beirut's signature move once she learns how to do it in the ring. Oof, I don't recommend doing that one in the ring. Actually, I don't know how you do that without really hurting yourself. And then all the girls like at their behest, like Sam takes off his shirt, and then everyone's really excited about it, and I. I don't know if this is just, like, how straight people are. Okay, I can give some, as a former straight person, okay, as okay. a retired straight person, um, I mean, I let my membership lapse. Uh, there's, you know, there's classes and certifications. So right. straightness is like a planet fitness? Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> it's 100% that. Anyway. But you don't get free pizza. <laughs> 
there is this like the one kind of power move that you can kind of do on men is to kind of like make them more physically vulnerable. Mm-hmm. And so I think this is one of those where it's like, well, we're out here and we're constantly, you know, vulnerable under your, your pressure. So it's like, so take your shirt off. And then it's like, but then we've still got to make you feel good about it because okay. it's like we feel badly about mocking a, 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 a man because yeah. we've been bred to kind of like, you know, encourage their socialization. So it's just like, well, come on, participate with us. And it's like, Woo! yeah, I guess where I was confused is like Jenny, like immediately goes from calling him out for his racism and then telling him to take off his top. It's lessening it. It, it, It's, it's that buffer, right? Where it's like, she's still got to work with this guy and she still is, has been conditioned um, to care about his, his, Mm -hmm. his psychology. Okay. So she's still got to do it because she's still fireable, but it's also like, she feels, she probably feels guilty, which is a very normal thing where it's like, oh, I, I, I you know, said anything bad to a, mm-hmm, a man. Mm-hmm. I, I worry I hurt his feelings. And what I've learned is that men don't think much about what we say. <laughs> yeah. To me, this kind of felt like an overreach, actually. Like, I, I actually, I like your rationale a lot, Lauren. Like, that, that makes sense to me. But to me, when I was watching it, it felt like it's not plausible that they would have asked him to do that. It's not plausible that they would be trying to include him in whatever their activities were because he's their mean and nasty boss. I mean, the hairdressers like, initiate it. That's sort of the... the that's true. Like that, that's and, true. and they're, like, supposed to be New Yorkers and not very good at boundaries. As someone who lives here, I can, I can cop to that. Um, <laughs> but, I, I don't know. It felt to me like an excuse to try to get Mark Marin to do something funny, and there's more of that later in the episode, yeah, and I, I, I just, I'm funny. fucking sick of it. So wasn't that funny? The next the next uh scene shows Bat has Bash showing the ladies clips of Gorgeous George, who is uh a famous pretty boy heel. He's actually also one of the first wrestlers to use uh entrance music. This looked like it was like from nineteen thirty. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. A- about, yeah. Token homophobia around whether or not he was gay. And then Carmen was- <laughs> Yeah. And then Carmen um has to explain like really basic wrestling psychology to Debbie. Who's like, I want a valet to come fix my hair or carry my medals when I come to the rings. Like, okay, so someone, one girl fucks your husband and suddenly you think you're entitled to a personal ins- assistant. Like, I, I kind of want to, like, say this. So one thing, Betty Gilpin sells this character left, right, and center, and that's why we like Debbie at all. Because yeah. Debbie is an entitled yep. piece of shit. Like, she is, like, the one chance to exert any power. She's been, like, a... She's got this friend fucks your husband. Her husband is terrible, as we kind of see later. She's like, I'm going to control it by, like, I want to have the most stuff. And, I mean, to be fair, her bosses can't even help her open the fucking stroller. Yeah. But, you know, I think the point is that we're kind of supposed to dislike her. She's the all-American girl. They're not great. And I don't, and I mean, I don't like, really understand this whole, like, Debbie did nothing with- wrong narrative, I have to say. I think she did a fair amount of wrong things. Um, it kind of makes sense that she would hang out with Ruth, because in some ways they're equally terrible. Well, I think she also gets to feel superior to Ruth. I want to yep. uh, just jump in and clarify that um, Gorgeous George debuted in 1940. His, he, Gorgeous George debuted his gimmick in 1941 <laughs> in okay, Eugene, so we Oregon. Okay, through the Great Depression. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Would that have been in reels? Would, I mean, yeah, maybe know? depending depending on the region. I mean, this is still when wrestling is still very regional, and like we're about to hit the war period. Yeah, we are. Um, and that and that is that kind of marks like the this like resurgence, this like renaissance of like women's wrestling. Um, right. <laughs> which we will, which which we will talk about in a future episode. So okay, so like, so they're all talking about like, you know, characters and personas they want to have, and then Britannica is like, I want an accent, but not the one I have. Okay, is the is the gimmick behind Britannica that it's like she's American or something all along? Do you want me to spoil it for you? No. Well, then I can't tell you. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I was interesting. Say, you want to tell like, you? Until I knew it was Kate Nash, I'm like, boy, why does she sound Australian? But she's, like, genuinely British. Yeah. I'm not sure if that was just, like, an ad lib. And then uh, at some point, Sam's like, I can't film you doing the hugging move for 20 (laughs) minutes. And then Britannic's like, what if your gimmick is hugging people? And that's clearly a jab or a reference to Bailey, right? Like, that has to be, like, the writer's like, I know a wrestler. 100%. Bailey, like, all of her merchandise says, like, hug me or I'm a hugger. And... She gives hugs to people who are her friends, and one of her moves in the ring basically looks like a hug where you toss somebody. Oh, so it's kind of like, it's kind of like, it's like jujitsu, where like, if you don't think about it too much, it does look like hugging. It's like it's just rapping. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, so so we do. Um, there's you might a, a kicking in the punch. <laughs> well, there there's a queer jujitsu class that meets every Friday, and like it is marketed as as like aggressive cuddling. 
That's how that's how like all the queer people sort of <laughs> say it to each other. That's awesome. So the ladies break off into pairs. Vicky the Viking is like putting one of the sisters <laughs> and a Stacy, the blonde sister in like a headlock in the background. And Britannica spanks Melrose with the principles of genetics. I'm so into it. So was Melrose. Yeah. Yeah, Melrose clearly enjoyed it. Oh. Um, so Didn't then we all stop hitting you with knowledge. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Except for Avery. <laughs> with permission, of course. Ruth pitches the character of Mint Julep, <laughs> which is me very congested trying to do a southern accent. And it's about as good as hers. An evil southern debutante, which is essentially what Liberty Bell is. <laughs> yeah. Which is no less plausible than Hunter Hearst Helmsley, which was Triple H's original gimmick of being the Connecticut Blue Blood, where he was a snobby rich guy. Can- okay. Anyway. That was a real thing. Mm-hmm. I don't have enough energy for the rage. <laughs> Immediately, I was just like, I just crushed this toilet paper roll that I've been using to pull my nose. Sam's not into it. Then there's the Antichrist, uh, the worst aunt ever, kind of an evil person who gives out, gives out raisins to kids on Halloween. Which should be a punishable offense under the court of law. So there, there, totally <laughs> there was a very religious couple in my neighborhood when I was growing up that <laughs> had religious reasons why they don't like Halloween. So their way around that was every Halloween they would just give out like stacks of pennies. Oh, God, and they would leave. I knew those people too. They would leave them. Uh, they would leave it on their porch. So like you, they wouldn't talk to you. They wouldn't. But you would just come up and take your stack of pennies. And that's like such a. That, that is like such a children <laughs> of the corn. So, like that's so, how you appease the fucking like you know local kid who's like who who impaled your wife on a spike or something. <laughs> so the, okay, to so the children who are not listening, but to like maybe their parents <laughs> to give them ideas for your own personal entertainment. Anybody that gives your kid an apple, you throw them back at their doors when their doors are shut. You um, the raisins, I would recommend you just I don't know drop them off at the local police station or something. And uh, whenever anybody <laughs> gave you Bible verses. Oh, that was the worst. The Set those on fire and put them on their lawn. Yeah, or use them as rolling papers. Whatever the deal is. Yeah, like yeah. do you you do you? But seriously, I, I did think this was a really really terrible character. But unless she was shooting raisins out of a t shirt gun, I had no idea. Oh my god, that would be amazing. <laughs> uh, Trademarked. Nobody steal that. <laughs> I'll be premiering next year's Auntie Christ. So she confides in Sam that she's anxious when she feels behind in a group setting and he says wow what a fantastic quality <laughs> i'm sorry and it's like that is the most self-aware she's been though <laughs> this is another one of those moments for me where i'm like wow she and debbie are both egocentric enough that i have no problem believing that they tolerate each other's bullshit when you know when there isn't husband fucking going other. on like like i kind of feel like ruth blew the whole debbie's mean to me out of proportion thing like she's got everything and i've got nothing i'm like she does not have that much but it's also like the second that debbie could have everything she's lording it over <laughs> yeah so uh shame pairs her up with sheila which ruth says is not a good idea because they're in a bit of an awkward uh situation she kind of does the, the, the throat cutting gesture and sam goes what her too what are you radioactive which like Ruth is an artist who's never had a real job and therefore has no idea how to work with people she doesn't naturally like. I mean, but so this is the deal with kind of the Sam we used to be Ruth thing. Like, he's worked enough where he gets to kind of get away with, to some degree, being prickly. Where do we think Ruth waitressed? Um, <laughs> the, the Sunday morning shift of a Waffle House, like an IHOP, <laughs> but didn't, that one that was in the, in the middle of closing down. Oh, okay, okay. Well, she, maybe I was going to say Waffle House don't close down, that's like... No, 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 I mean, like, they were like, they're like oh, It's like the standard, like... Oh, uh, okay. To shut it down. Okay, okay. Like, but no, like, there's the, there's the <laughs> like, FEMA, like, rates, like, how bad natural disasters are with, like, whether or not Waffle Houses are still open. Because Waffle Houses are, like, like fucking stacked to the hilt with fucking, like, rations and, and power generators. Um, I think that she was a waitress at a buffet. So, like, she wasn't really a waitress. She just, like, well, yeah, that refilled, co- refilled Cokes and, like, took pla- like, basically bus tables. And she's like, I'm putting, I'm paying my dues. And I'm right. like, nah. I think she was a hostess at a Valley's. Ooh, what is a Valley's? It was originally kind of like Friendly's, and I think it got bought by the, the company that now owns Friendly's. What is a Friendly's? You don't know what a Friendly's is? I've lived on the really? west. I've lived on the west side of America since I came to okay. America. Wait, 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 wait. Um, it's kind of like it's a little bit fancier than Denny's at below and Applebee's. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and it's known for its ice cream, and it do, just, it has kind of like. Okay, do they? Okay, so is it like they? Do they? It's like a big um, boy. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So, do they wear like checkered, the like what uh, maroon? Maroon. Normally, okay. Maroon, yeah. Uh, 
Oh. And they have like a separate ice cream counter usually. Oh you can shit! Go in if you're just getting ice. Oh god, cream. I love those. They let you buy them in pints, or you can order the Sundays. Oh my god, it's great! It's a really good yeah. thing. I mean, the food is shit terrible, but you know what you do. The chicken fingers are tolerable if you have to eat there. Yeah. Like, again, it's, like, the bland American food will, like, it's good hangover food. Yeah. Or it's good, like, Sunday morning with grandparents for the first time in five years kind of food. Okay. So Sam <laughs> is, pairs the met up anyway because, like, conflict is good. So it's funny that, like, <laughs> she's finally getting that method acting that she's been fucking ganging <laughs> on about. trying to avoid. She's um, like, I'm not Daniel Day-Lewis in this scene. Uh, so Ruth and, and Sheila are, like, hanging on the ropes. Like, not, not the ring ropes, but, like, they're hanging on, like, the gym, like, climb up the ropes. But not, I mean... Also not really, because those are just genuine ropes. Yeah. Like, which would hurt your hands. Yeah, well, I mean, I, th- I think it's like, there's this, like, moment where they're both kind of being, like, guarded and vulnerable, and they're totally. just, like, clinging. And this just, like, made me think of, like, did you read the Business Insider article about, like, Alison Bree's, like, intense, like, workout re- regimen? I, I, a little depressing, actually. Ruth is terrible. Alison Bree is phenomenal. Yeah. This is what we've taken away from it. Um, so, Ruth suggests that they go full werewolf werewolf with Sheila. Just like, you can enter in a cage or wear a collar. And She's the, always so helpful. And the announcer could go, it's a full moon tonight, <laughs> ladies and germs. And Bash loves this idea. And Sheila is really unhappy. And, like, she immediately is like, werewolves are mythical creatures. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a wolf. Yeah, she's definitely, like, um, I'm another kin. It's definitely and, another kin. Yeah, and Bash just, like, walks away. He's like, all right, I fixed this. Sheila yeah, just has this, know, like, deep, that intense does. stare at Ruth. So then we get this, like, little skit of, like, Machu Picchu and Welfare Queen playing out their gimmicks, uh, which is really cute. It's like, you know, everyone's having fun, everyone's watching, and everyone's, like, starting to really get into the groove of it. Um, and then right when they start grappling, that's when Goliath Jackson and her brothers show. Well, so Goliath Jackson and Carmen's brothers uh, the way that I originally wrote and said that made it sound like Goliath Jackson was a lady. <laughs> um, so we meet Carmen's family, Goliath Jackson and um, Who and, and the other Lumber Jacksons. Yes. So Goliath Jackson is played by Winston James Francis, and then her brothers are played by the wrestlers Brodus Clay and Carlito. Brodus Clay, he was in WWE for a while, and his gimmick was that he was the Funkasaurus. So he would wear like a pimp hat and dance, and he had like he had the Funkettes. Like, he had, like, two women who would, like, dance with him and party with him. Um, One of whom is now the SmackDown Women's Champion. Correct. Naomi. And then Carlito comes from a famous wrestling line of the Colognes. Okay, um, so everything is kind of in, in, in sync. Yeah, yeah. So I actually was there um, June 20th, 2005, <coughs> in Phoenix, Arizona. I saw Carlito win the Intercontinental title off Shelton, Shelton Benjamin. And I marked, like, a fucking a mark. I was a dirty mark. It was so... Explain to us what a mark is, pretty good, actually. So, um, mark is a name given to fans that accept the product as it is and cheer the people they're supposed to cheer and don't engage with the product critically. Um, They don't engage with it like it's a product. They just, like, engage with it like, I'm watching a theater performance and I'm excited about it. Yeah, so marks are the people that, like, do the thing that promoters want them to do. Mm -hmm. And then you have what are called smarks or smart marks, and those are people, I guess, like me, who, like, know a lot about the product and, like, react to the product based on that knowledge and not based on their own feelings. Oh, okay. So Carlito's old gimmick when he was in WWE is he would eat an apple, and if you did not want to be cool, he would spit parts of the apple in your face. That is Um, a gimmick. And it was so over. So, okay, so we get, like, Goliath, like, inspecting the ring, and then, you know, he he asks Bash if he's the promoter, and Bash is like, no, I'm more like the blah, blah, blah. And then trying to come up with a fancier title. Yeah. Um, and then Sam comes up and says he's the director. Brodus, Brodus Clay asks if he directed Star Wars. And when Sam says no, he just walks away dejected. <laughs> and then his brother says, I love Star Wars. <laughs> so <laughs> Goliath says he's taking Carmen back home. Um, he wants her to have a job and meet a nice man. And uh, a job where people respect her. And when she's like, people respect me here, he says, nobody respects a lady wrestler, sweetie. It's like the midgets. You're a sideshow. That is probably the realest quote like this is the this that is the moment where I I, I will actually kind of um, tip my hat as as, as uh, I'll tip your hat because you're wearing one right now um, to the writers <laughs> of the show because like that 
not that's not just like a good one liner like that's actually a historical analysis so there's this line a quote in Lipstick and Dynamite which we're going to review together in a future episode and there's a quote where someone kind of talks about like old promoter logic in the in the 40s and 50s and it went something kind of like this it's not verbatim but you know it's the if you can't get a woman get a midget if you can't get a midget get a giant if you can't get a giant get an Indian if you can't get an Indian get a bear right like there was this like basically anything that wasn't a man was a novelty and you needed the novelty sometimes to get a couple extra butts in the seats Mm -hmm. um but yeah that that line like really hit me hard an awful lot of wrestling fans still think that way yeah yeah sam stands up for carmen and then says goliath is an asshole and wears oversized diapers (laughs) for a living and then goliath backhand backhands him and sam hits the floor really hard but he bounces yeah which is really satisfying like i was oh yeah it's a little bit like when draco was punched and of course like of of course um sam like, standing up for Carmen and saying that, like, Goliath cannot speak to Carmen this way in front of him. When he's been speaking to her that way. Yeah. He bounces up and is immediately like, oh, what am I, a mouthy housewife? Yeah. Like, um, and then challenges him to hit him again. And then <laughs> Carmen gives in and, and leaves with her family. She tries to get her brothers to talk <laughs> to her. So she's going to save him again. Yeah. So she tries to get her brothers to talk to her dad. And they're like, no, nah, no, nah. he was pissed when he found your... Bash runs out, and thinking Goliath is like his overbearing mom, tries to convince Goliath to let Carmen stay by pretending to be in a relationship with her, which gets Goliath's other amazing like, super line. super weekly. Like, if he fell for it, he would have been the worst. Yeah. Um, Goliath's like, you want to wrestle? You need to learn how to sell. You're both terrible. <laughs> which, like, I kind of wondered, because uh, my read on the earlier scene, and I realized this may not be gospel, is that, you know, Carmen might be queer. So I was like, does he maybe know well uh, that she's queer? So a couple things i think people that grow up without mothers um tend to be a bit more butch especially when they really butch dads so it just could be kind of like that i guess quote the tomboy aspect anyway but like i definitely think there's like a queer butch angle on this i'm gonna guess he doesn't know he might not know but sometimes you still know oh yeah yeah yeah. like it's like yeah you you, you just don't say it because you're like maybe but you don't want to deal with it and then carmen takes a stand and and says that either he can be support either Goliath her father can be supportive or she can leave like her mother did Oof. and Ouch. that this is the first time in the show where we see a man be deflated in the way that like women are every episode yeah multiple times an episode yeah uh, now we now we have Sam laying on the on the couch putting ice to his face and Awesome Kong comes in and brings him some more he's actually holding a Moxie to his head I love Moxie have you ever had Moxie. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's it's like a cola, but it's um it's, it's made with like a specific root. It's like actually like it's actually pretty bitter. It's like root beery or like uh yeah yeah it's 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 kind of root beery. And um, he's already complaining how the fight wasn't fair. As if the amount of sympathy we have, it's just like it's you know it's not enough. And Kong tries to explain to him that she's worried about the racism of her character. And Sammy means it as a pushback against the Republican Party's austerity and race baiting shit. He sounds like Bill Maher. Yeah, <laughs> like he sounds like Bill Maher right now. Like I, that was my thought also. Like literally exactly when I was watching it. She says that she's worried that her son, who goes to Stanford, might not understand it's been a satire. Yeah, she says, "Are other people gonna know that?" He's like, "What other people? You clearly don't think anybody's gonna watch yeah. this show." She's so gracious about it too. Like Kia Stevens seems like a sweetheart in real life, com- in stark contrast to the character she plays in wrestling, and like. She's so gracious in this scene. She's not angry at all about anything. No, she's and I'm mostly su- unsure. Right, but I mean, I'm super, super curious if that was her choice to play it that way, or if the script explicitly told her that she had to play this very softly and very gently when she has this conversation with him. I mean, so far, the wrestlers have been the best actors in the show. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hands down. So Sam says that he, he wants to jolt people in consciousness with these with these gimmicks. And he loans her some cassettes of his films, which include Swamp Queen for the Viet Cong, <laughs> Gina the Machina, and Blood Disco 1 and 2, for inspiration on how, like, schlock and exploitation can, like, wake people up and be used to make points. And But one of them is banned in 49 states. Yeah, and he's proud of that. So this actually reminded me of, have either of you seen Machete Maidens Unleashed? <laughs> No. Uh, after um, uh, Marcos took control of the Philippines, he basically opened the country up to American and, like, uh, I mean, outside directors to come in and make, like, j- you know, um, schlocky jungle films with, like, the, with, like, you know, using his mil- using the military, you know, in in the films and like being able to use all those basically this, the resources of the state. Um, and so 
it's this film about like the history of that genre. Um, and it's, uh, there's a lot about the gender politics and the race politics of that. And like how a lot of, you know, there's a lot of these quotes of like white directors being like, yeah. And like people just think it's about feminism or, you know, class warfare. We're totally fine with them believing that. Ugh. I was actually going to include some, some quotes from the documentary in this review, but like the one blog that has like really good quotes is like run by like a sex negative turf. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank um, you. Uh, who who runs an action movie <laughs> website? Like <laughs> anyone, uh, literally anyone can run a website these days. Now we're going to take our intermission. Mm-hmm. Everyone, get a snack, get a drink. What, um, what, Chelsea? What 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 do you think uh, is like the for you? What is what is your wrestling snack? My wrestling snack. Um, if I'm trying to be healthy, it's <laughs> an apple and some string cheese. <laughs> If I'm not trying to be healthy, it's salami and chocolate covered almonds. Ooh. The the chocolate covered almonds are very useful during stressful paper <coughs> where I know there's gonna be a match that I'm like gonna have a lot of feels about and I just yeah. need something I can shove in my mouth to keep myself from screaming at the T V the entire time. What about you guys, wrestling snacks? You know, uh for me. So I once interviewed Natalie Slater, um, who runs the blog Bacon Destroy. She's a vegan blogger. Yeah, that's badass. And a, and a, she's awesome. Yeah, and a, and a, <clears throat> yeah, she's a big vegan blogger and a big wrestling fan. Um, I asked her this question like a couple years ago, and she she said nachos, and I've I've really come to believe that. I have uh, I have once eaten nachos out of a storage unit. And, <laughs> and wait, wait, wait. really loose in the storage unit? No, they weren't loose. <laughs> no, okay. So there's this there's this <laughs> wrestling company here in um, the Bay Area called East Bay Pro, and they're in Pacheco, so that's like a half hour or so north of us. Okay. Um, and yeah, they wrestle out of like a storage unit, oh, okay. like and uh, like a big storage, like a fancy storage unit. It's got a bathroom, like it's not. Oh, okay, it's kind of yeah. cool. And so they have the. But own, it's still like yeah, it's like a okay. tiny house. Yeah. I mean, it's still a, a, a yeah. It still has a garage door, <laughs> um, and you like definitely want to sit. And you basically like if you are sitting, if you are not like yeah, there is a garage door open, and basically like if you are sitting on that side, you're basically going to get really shit photos. But yeah, like they have a little concession stand, and, and they give out nachos, and and I've eaten nachos there. Um, the thing with like wrestling is just that like you're afforded so like it's it's really tough because like people are you know carrying their bags they're carrying the merch that they buy they're carrying their cameras like there's you get you need something that you can just like slip under your seat mm-hmm. so I, I'm actually Im- impressed like legitimately impressed that you bring fresh produce. I'll, I'm not gonna lie though like if I'm in an arena and I don't have produce or like anything I've like prepared to bring with me um, I'll totally get nachos that's exactly what I'll get. I generally Maybe. eat uh, Oreo, birthday cake Oreos and dark chocolate almond milk. Ooh. Ooh. But I do it, you know, so like little Oreo cereal. Uh-huh. If you want the grown-up version, you just roll <laughs> So, like, you know, there's a pizza place by us now that sells deep-fried Oreos, and they deliver. The food of my people. <laughs> that exists near where I live, too, but I, I hear that here in New York, we don't do them right. Apparently, the the grease is not the right kind of grease. You're, yeah, there's, well, there's judging how you do elephant ears, that kind of makes some sense. What's an elephant ear? An elephant ear is, in the Midwest, it is a um, deep-fried piece of dough that you uh, put powdered sugar on, but in uh, in New England, specifically, I'm, I imagine this in New York, too, they do a non-sweetened dough, which they put marinara sauce on. Oh, okay, It's okay. a fair food. Okay, all right. So, Chelsea, your assignment today <laughs> you're going to explain to lauren um the concept of heat and how it pertains to wrestling so in wrestling if you're talking about heat what you're talking about is either the crowd reaction to a wrestler or real life animosity that exists between people in wrestling so sometimes when somebody's talking about how much heat a wrestler has, they're talking about how much the crowd doesn't like that particular wrestler. So bad guy and he's doing something and it makes you mad, you boo, that's heat, if lots of people boo. Sometimes they'll also say like, oh, so-and-so has heat backstage, meaning like, oh, you can tell from the way that particular angle is happening in that storyline that that wrestler looks bad and maybe their employer is setting them up to look bad because they're angry with that wrestler. And that actually, in uh, WWE, that happens a lot. (laughs) Uh, uh, Really hard to picture Vince McMahon as a vindictive asshole. And uh, cheap heat is... Cheap heat is, like, 
heat you get by insulting the fans, usually. A really good heel can get cheap heat by talking about mainstream news as part of a promo, and it's kind of dumb honestly um it's not meant to be like a like a deep sincere boo reaction it's meant to be like the audience will boo because they know they're supposed to the other really classic example is talking about a um local sports team so like chris jericho does that all the time on monday night raw is whichever city they're in he'll be like okay so your sports team it they suck (laughs) Or Kevin Owens will get cheap heat because he's Canadian and he talks about how being Canadian, he's saving America with having the U.S. title because he's the U.S. champion. He's the new face of America and America needs his Canadian soul to save them so much. I hate it when they tell the truth. (laughs) Oh, it's yeah, I know, I know, seriously. X-Pac heat, or X-Pac, I guess, it's Triple H heat, nuclear heat, it's all kind of the same thing. That is when the fans legitimately... It's not It's not like the fan relationship to a heel, where they're booing the heel, and that's part of like an understood component of interacting with the medium. It's when they're booing the wrestler that's there, specifically because they genuinely hate that wrestler and don't want to see them at all. A lot of times, if you watch like early footage from John Cena's career, mm-hmm. when when he, I mean, he had nuclear heat for a while, or like any segment that Vicky Guerrero has ever done for WWE, or Eva Marie when she was in NXT. If you look that up on YouTube, you'll see a very pretty red woman or red-haired woman with no expression <laughs> on her face walk out to a ring and just the crap gets booed out of her. I mean, like, the announcer can't even really, like, talk about the match because she's being booed so loudly. And it's because the people in the audience genuinely hate her and don't want to watch her wrestle. You'll be happy to know that um, X-Pac is named after um, X-Pac, Sean Waltman, who's a friend of Triple H. (laughs) Shocker. Although X-Pac, I don't know, he... Sometimes, for a long time, he was that guy. And now he seems to be somebody that fans sort of have some kind of affection and tolerance for. But that may be because he seems to be a slightly better person in real life than, uh, well, than Triple H. Mm, I, I think, well, actually, I think that, like, wrestling fans are kind of unique in certain ways in that, like, wrestling fans actually believe in redemption arcs. Yeah, that's <laughs> Like, sure. that's you know, true. if you persevere through being a, a guy that everyone hated for, like, so many years, eventually they just come to... I mean, fucking Billy Gunn is is working New Japan right now. Like, everyone gets a second chance, or a third, or a fourth, or a fifth chance in wrestling. And that's part of, uh, of what makes it exploitative, because, like, you've got guys who are, like, in their 40s and 50s wrestling because they don't really have any other, uh, like, avenues for, like, making a living. Yeah, but it's also, like... Skills. Yeah, but it's also, like, people want to see that. So, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for... Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, thank that you was for a, educating Yeah, that was a really good um, explanation. Oh. Oh, good. I'm glad. So uh, we return to the show, um, and Debbie comes home to find her husband is waiting for her, and he reads a letter he wrote about how he's moving back in, and now it's his house, and he pays the bills, and she can file a divorce if she doesn't like it. I have read a letter to somebody. Because... That wasn't my objection. <laughs> what was your objection? My objection is that he is a piece of shit. Like, yeah. He, like, yeah. He really does seem to like have this whole, like, you, you have power over me thing, but he is... He is a moderately successful man with low self-esteem that gets off on getting the prettiest woman he can and destroying her self-esteem and destroying her agency. I get really irritated with the arc involving him in later episodes. Yeah. To me, he just reads as dopey. Like, he just reads... I guess, like, so honestly, as someone who has not dated or been in relationships with men, I, I kind of... Like, I, I mean, I understand, obviously, conceptually, like, the ways in which, like, men uh, in, engender oppression, but, like, also, like, in this case, I'm like... No, he just seems dumb, and like that's like usually a red flag. That he's just like, <sighs> yeah, uh. he's dumb, but it's not it's not a harmless dumb. No, okay, it's yeah, I, I can, I, yeah, I can get that. So he asks if he can put Randy to bed. She storms off, and I guess like now I need to like four episodes in. It is weird to have a baby called Randy. It's like having a baby called Carl <laughs> with a C. <laughs> Like, with a K, okay, that's Looking fine. Look at you, Peaky Blinder. <laughs> just, like, I don't know, there's just something about, like, having a child named Randy, like, a child, yeah, like, a, a child named so Randy. Is his name Randall, then? Like, yeah, I probably. Maybe. Oh, he has, that, that poor baby has to be named after somebody. Yeah. Right? You know, but you get a middle name, and then you name him something normal, like Brian or something. Yeah. It's not a great name, but it's something. Like, Randy dooms him. The name of Randy dooms him to be the guy 
who hovers around the grill at every barbecue, backseat driving. Yeah. The alpha male who is just trying to grill his steaks in peace. The viper. <laughs> so <laughs> Debbie runs off. Um, so Ruth comes back to her hotel room, and Sheila is reading Clan of the Cave Bear. Which is so on the nose. <laughs> yeah. I, I read this book. It was very, like... This and Mists of Avalon, which I do not recommend you read, uh, the author is terrible. Um, and I do not know that of the Clan of the Cave Bear. But, like, it was kind of instrumental and kind of, like, subversive in that you had older women teaching younger men how to have sex and, like, make them good at sex. But that's it. It's, like, many pages. <laughs> how many times do you think Sheila has read Eaters of the Dead? Five times? It depends. When uh, when she recognized the wolfness in herself. Hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Does she say that? I was actually wondering that. I didn't pay. I didn't pay close enough attention. No, she didn't. Um, well, she says that she's been doing it for five years. Mm. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, she. We'll give it a three. Okay, yeah. Uh, Eaters of the Dead came out in 1976, so she's had six years. Yeah, I think three times in six years that makes sense. Yeah. I've never read a book twice, so I, I don't know. Have you ever read a fiction book twice? Yeah. Uh, I have when, it, when, it, when I read it. Well, some of it was I was required to. I, had, I was an English major. I've seen oh, yeah, uh, yeah. The Great Gatsby three times. Um, Embarrassingly, I have also, but I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I've also like I read Treasure Island a couple times. Like I, I kind of waited a period of time and then like reread things. Um, they usually don't hold up. So Ruth notices a horrible smell and finds a dead squirrel tucked under the sheets. <sighs> It is. It's really good. And then Sheila uh, just makes full eye contact with her, and it's like, I think you need to sleep somewhere else. And Ruth just, like, defiantly just wraps the squirrel up in a towel, and she's like, I'm not going anywhere. So take your squirrel and, and sleep somewhere else, you, you, you goddamn wolf. And I just, uh, I just before we get into this, I just have to mention that, like, this is as good a time as any to mention that at my wedding reception, um, my wife's cat uh, murdered a mouse for the first time and dragged it into the house. And I was the asshole because I was really creeped out by it. Like, everyone else was fawning over him and being like, because apparently you're supposed to do that when your cat murders an animal and brings it into the house. I mean, why? You have food for him. <laughs> Doesn't that know is kind of normal. <laughs> that is kind of normal cat behavior. I mean, it is super yeah. normal cat behavior, but you are like, I appreciate your wedding gift, but a cupcake would have sufficed. Yeah. Supposedly when they do that, it's because they think you're such a crappy hunter. Yeah, and they're like, here's some snacks, how. weirdo. Well, you know, if mice came in ginger wasabi flavor like my wedding cupcakes did, then I would maybe go out and do that. That sounds delicious. It, they were really great. They were really good. Yeah. So Sheila gets out of bed and is like, you just called me a goddamn wolf. And Ruth doesn't realize this This means a lot to her. Sheila says that, you know, just, most people just call me a freak. And she takes the squirrel and dumps it outside. And then Sheila sits down with Ruth and explains that she's been, <laughs> that she's worn some variation of her makeup and outfit every day for the last five years. It's not a costume. It's It's just me, she says. What I put on, what I wear, it's not for you. It's for me. Beep, 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 trans feeling. Like, I mean, well, I mean, I think this is very clearly meant as, like, a trans other kin analog of, like... Mm. I mean, it's also very, like, that's a very modern, like, wo- like feminist idea of, like, you know, women dress for themselves and not for right. men. And women can sometimes forget that about other women. Yeah. And then Ruth says, like, I, uh, uh, Sheila says, I know that I'm a human, but spiritually, I'm a wolf. On all levels except physical, I am a wolf. I knew we were getting to this. I knew we were going to get the Sh- Anne Shirley reference. I knew it was going to happen, and it made me so angry. Because I know that she floated down the fucking, like, river, like, reciting the Lady, of Shalott. the Lady of Shalott. Ugh. So, uh, Ruth shares that when her grandfather died, she was really depressed and dressed like Anne of Green Gables and dressed that way every year for a whole year. God. That's so relatable. Anyway. I'm annoyed that it's relatable. probably pined for her Gilbert. They both acknowledge that they haven't lived with anyone for a long time. And then Ruth, when Sheila's like, we should have a system for privacy, Ruth's like, oh, we'll do the sock on the door trick. And then Sheila immediately puts a sock on the door <laughs> to show that she could use some privacy and Ruth needs to leave now. And it's late and it's like, you know, it's, it's a very rude time to need alone time. Yeah. And then she just deadbolts the door. <laughs> and uh, so then we go to the other room where everyone else, all the other women and uh, Cherry's husband are watching Blood Disco. And then I put um, obligatory scene of a man coming to sit down with a bunch of women uninvited. Yeah. Um, Brit- yeah. Britan- In a bathrobe. It's always a bathrobe. Britannica is drinking some Diet 7-Up. There are multiple myths and origin stories as to how 7-Up got its name. 
There are some pe- there there are some sources that say it's because that is the <laughs> pH balance, um, which is not which isn't true. It's like a it's like a four, um, or that it has uh, or that it comes in a seven ounce bottle, whereas most sodas at the time when they were doing glass bottles they were six ounces. Um, there's also one that's like it's the atomic number of like it, yeah it's like it's like the atomic number of like one of the chemicals in it. Um, just fun little. This is what happens when nerds make things. <laughs> This is like every single startup I've ever <laughs> Jetta, you know how J.R. Tolkien always writes like every scene in any book has a paragraph and a half about like let's describe this vegetation that's yeah. right next to the road. Don't forget the rocks. That's, that's you but with food things <laughs> in this you show. And I find, <laughs> I find it You know what's funny? I find it really delightful. <laughs> but in this podcast. What's actually funny is I didn't read um Lord of the Rings books until I was in high school um, because when I was young what was really popular among the kids in my group were, were the stone wall. Oh yeah. Or no. the red wall? Red wall. Oh yeah. yeah. Stone wall is too. just timeless. But <laughs> no the red wall books which where it's like four pages just like yeah it's like, it'll be, it's like, it's like these, these it's books. It's for younger audience. Well it's these books about basically racism of like oh how like certain people are just born evil and then in between. But they're rodents? Yeah. Right. And then, like, you know, he would write these, like, six, seven pages describing, like, all the foods that would be at a feast. And then, like, two pages. That's it's very like, fantasy. And then the, like, the the lesser peoples invade Redwall and <laughs> take all the food. Yeah. Um, there was some death in those books that really upset me, and I can't remember which one it was. The thing I, d- I don't like about Brian Chalk, in addition to his just his fucking, like, blatant racism and using animals to, to do that, is just that, like, he always makes the characters say what he thinks. And oh, yeah, everybody's a Mary Sue. Yeah. Well, and, and like, so specifically, there's this, like, one book, um, um, I think it's, like, The Shadow of Redwall or something, but it's this book about, like, someone who is outcast, like a ferret who's, you know, one of the born evil species, and he is cast out of Redwall for being evil, and then he dies um, saving, like, his adopted mother from his biological father, who's, like, a ferret warlord. Um, and basically, like, yeah, he dies and sacrifices himself, and, like, Brian Jocks like, makes it all the, all the, like, uh, you know, quote, sensible characters, like, you know, say at the end, like, oh, he just did it out of spite, he didn't really care, like, ferrets never learn to love, and it's like, so, just so you know, like, you know, uh, if you ever wonder, like, wow, Jenna, like, how, at 30, and as a trans queer woman, how do you stomach wrestling? Like, that's what I read, like, this is the shit that I was really I into. Was the gauntlet. Yeah. I have a, I have a, I have a high, um, not an appetite. High pain tolerance. Yeah, there we go. High, high pain tolerance. So, uh, Debbie moves into the motel. Just a, just like, it's like, like 30 second bit. Where she yeah, there's moves a lot the, of jumping around. Of yeah, scenes. she moves in and then the guy gives her the key and that's it. That's but now we're back to everyone watching the movie. And they're really grossed out by the movie. Yeah, it's like Suspiria, right? Yeah. It's like weird gross out films. And then Keith, Cherry's husband, reveals that he was in the movie. He was, he was, he was the stunt man in the movie. And then, um... Awesome Kong, you know, leans over to him and is like, from one professional to the other, you know, is Sam like a typical white racist director? And then Keith is like, he's more sexist than racist in my experience. I had no idea how to take that. And I actually feel this is a little too modern. Okay, I absolutely understand that, like, marginalized people have these discussions. We have these discussions about, like, you know, quote, straight allies all the time. Mm -hmm. But, like, there's just something about the way this is phrased that is so written, it's blatant that it was written by a white woman. So, uh, why would Awesome Kong ask him that and not Cherry? And yeah. she clearly doesn't believe him either. Yeah. But just, yeah, the way that, like, just, like, the way that he phrases it and, like, makes sure to couch it in his experience, like, it's such a, it's such a, like, a white woman's, like, interpretation of intersectionality of, like, yeah. That's just, like, that, that, that moment kind of jarred out to me. Uh, so then, right at the climax of this movie, which shows, like, a uh, disco ball, like, raining blood, and then everyone looks up. Uh, the cassette cuts out, and it's, like, some <laughs> interview that Sam did for a dating service. But, like, recently. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. the same. Um, where he's just, like, talking about, like, how he wants someone who, you know, uh, won't scream at him or p- pick him apart for his mistakes or um, someone fun with a great smile and great figure. Oh, he also specifies under 30. Yeah. 
Um, Somebody's willing to spend the rest of my life with me. And everyone just kind of like watches this dumbstruck, just like it's they're seeing something very vulnerable. And there's this like wide spectrum of uh, of reactions to it. And then Stacy, who's one of the biddies, the the blonde one, says that she'd fuck him because he ends. So he ends. His, I don't believe that. He ends his uh, his bit with like I'm lonely and my cock works great. And she's like, Well, yeah, he's cute, lonely, and his cock works great. I'd do it. And that's when Cherry's husband leaves, and they have totally <laughs> fucked. I'm I'm I firmly believe this. That that it was not a spit roasting. I I think it was a I think it was a devil's threesome. Okay. So I can't see Cherry having a threesome <laughs> without the expectation. Like, yeah, you got to do that too. It's hot. Get in there. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, what? How did how did you both feel about the dating service video? Um, w- w- <sighs> you dummy. Like <laughs> like how did he like mysteriously slip that in? Was that, like, a tension move? Like, it was a plot. But it was also, like, he wraps up in, like... I think they've done a very good job at this, actually. They've, they've made the, the token white male misogynist a full character because, you know, that's what we do. Yeah. He just... He does, like, seem really, really sad, but also incredibly not self-aware. But it's, like, you do get the impression that like, nobody's ever been nice to him. But, like, he's never been nice to anyone else. Yeah. You can't be a friend if you're not friendly. The scene has a kind of ominous quality because I feel like every girl who's watching it has a different sort of reaction because this illustrates like her very specific context with Sam and that and that ranges from like you know the biddies wanting to fuck him and all the way to Awesome Kong now saying that she has learned a lot from that video. Yeah, that his dick probably does not work great. I wanted a scene where the women got together to do something like watching a movie and talking about it, but I was really disappointed that when they did, it revolved around Sam. Uh, like, it's this, not a Bechtel scene, for sure. That shit felt so fucking unnecessary to me. And like, Jesus Christ, am I sick of stuff that is related to Sam's dick by the end of the series. <laughs> like, I I just re-watching this before this podcast today, having watched the whole series, I was just... Oh, it was nauseating, honestly. I was like, no, I don't <coughs> care about your dick. We get to the end of the episode where Debbie is walking Randy around the pool, I guess to sort of uh, imprint upon him what his life... Like, he's just always going to be a fucking pool bum, you know, uh, tailgating minor league baseball parties. <laughs> uh, she notices Ruth asleep on a lawn chair across from her uh, as she as she herself descends onto a chair. And she perks up and looks around to see if anyone's watching like it's very performative like <clears throat> she sees like her supposed arch enemy and the first thing she she does is like to look around and see if like anyone will will see her being like remotely benign about this and then decides that it's safe and she falls asleep and, and we get this like shot of the two of them sleeping on opposite sides of a pool at night uh, like we get it show <laughs> like yeah this is being hit over the head. I think that the expected audience here was supposed to be women and their boyfriends. It's yeah. Something that men would care about. Yeah. So, uh, that is the episode. How did we feel about it? I actually really liked it. Yeah? <laughs> I really liked it. I think that now the season is finally starting to cook. The second episode was a bit of a drag. The third one finally gave us some ammunition, and now we get to kind of see like the plots moving along. Like, Ruth is still really arrested, which is kind of nice. I like that she's stunted and kind of isn't allowed to come forward while a lot of other people kind of blossom out of the background. I wish we could definitely do more of that. But I actually really like this episode. You know, pandering aside, it was... I enjoyed it. Like, and I, you know, I could get through it, and, and I, I kind of like the, the in-depth attitude that we, we got for Carmen. I, I, I love her. I want, I want her in every scene. Just sort of edging in, smiling at me. How did you feel about the ending? Like, did you feel like that was strong and like well done well if you're a grudge holder that made sense mm. to me like it's just like she's like of course she's like wandering around trying to find who, where her place is and then she sees Ruth and she gets to like pity her but then like there, she, I think she's just sort of like she's asleep I, I mean I, I I thought it was it was fine I thought it was a pretty like we're, we're clearly supposed to get the, the get the band back together again mm-hmm. and so we've got to kind of put them in proximity to do that do you feel it's too uh, I, I I kind of I kind of felt that it was a little too early. No, I actually think it was late. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I think that's important. Like, she's got to live with her. She's got to work with her. Yeah. And, you know, that's it. Like, we've, we've got to, like, depart from that narrative. And <laughs> we've got to build Debbie up to be anything other than that. Like, yeah. the, you know, the scorned woman, scorched earth type. Yeah. So. How, did, how did you feel about this episode, Chelsea? Um, it's okay. I was frustrated by some things. I didn't really like the fact that Sheila forgave Ruth for being an idiot. I didn't really buy that they were going to have a moment of sisterhood and bonding at the end there, just because Ruth, like, in a moment of anger, called Sheila 
the thing that Sheila thinks she is, and then all of a sudden Sheila thinks Ruth is great now. Like, that that just didn't really... I don't know. Um, I didn't like, again, that the movie scene was Mark Maron's (laughs) dick and people talking about Mark Maron's dick, and I want to know more about characters who aren't Ruth and Debbie, and this episode had a lot of that in it compared to the previous episodes, but I want more of it. That is my most continuous complaint with the show. So I I felt that... I thought that this episode is a good middle section. It's uncomfortable to watch right now, but I think it's better that they show the toll that the show is taking on the women yeah, 100%. Um, early so that we don't have to fall, so that we don't have to do it at the end and have this like overly drawn out, what have we done, denouement of the first season? Because I mean, obviously there's going to be more seasons of this. And so I, I kind of like that they're paying it forward with like how fucked up and like stupid and unneedlessly cruel this uh, the show and the experience was for the women what did you learn this week so i learned that there are kind of three types of heat so the traditional heat of audience v wrestler and and kind of the traditional like play narrative there's also apparently uh it's uh, perfectly fine from a human resources perspective to just like <laughs> vilify your employees <laughs> And make their lives really hard um, to prove a point, um, which is, I guess, Mm -hmm. X-Pac. And then there's also Cheap Heat, which is, I guess, when people just sort of hate you because, (laughs) like, (laughs) it's so interesting to kind of feel, like, hear how that's courted. Mm -hmm. And how that's, like, such a big part of the conflict. It's like reality television. What is our most Marin moment? Most Marin moment. Uh, mine, my most Marin moment is when he clarifies that he needs to uh, date somebody who's under 30. Uh, for me, it's standing up for Carmen and then complaining when he's not getting enough sympathy for it. <laughs> I'm going to say talking about his dick. Yeah. The fact that it was sort of like split into his movie is like very Mark Marin-y. Chelsea, where can you be found? Uh, shoulders underscore up on Twitter or shoulders up.net. Jenna, where can you be found? I can be found at J-E-T-T-A underscore R-A-E. My food blog is fryhavoc.com. And uh, our website is glowthedistance.xyz. Our uh, Twitter is glowthedistance. We have a Facebook page. We have a SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash glowthedistance. Leave us, you know, comments on iTunes. You know, hey, drop us a line on Facebook or, you know, <clears throat> even comment on our SoundCloud. Like, any feedback we get is is so helpful and really helps us make the show better and know what, you know, what it is that, you know, our, our audience is, is uh, what, what kind of chum we need to throw in the water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you can find me at Lauren Inc. I N K on Twitter. You can also find my website at Lauren com. You can pledge my Patreon if you'd like to give me money and it's patreon.com slash Lauren Parker. And I'm on Facebook at Lauren Parker. You really did glow the distance today. We're all champions in the ring, Jenna. <laughs> hey, Glowhards. I've decided that that's my name for, our podcast fans, every podcast needs like a cool punny name for its fan, for its listeners. Um, it's part of building a community. Another part of building community, uh, routine, <laughs> uh, and, st- and reliability. Um, this is, I guess like the second week in a row where Lauren and I have both been too sick to do the karaoke. So I'm filling in with another cover song. I was able to, uh, learn moving out on my, um, melodic on time. So instead I'm going to play, an old song I used to play a lot on my guitar um, that's wrestling related. It's um, Man on the Moon by R.E.M. Um, I'm going to try and do this in one take without really having rehearsed it. I hope you enjoy, and if not, then uh, no hard feelings. Martha Hoople in the game of life Yeah, 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 yeah Andy Coffin in the wrestling match. Yeah, 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 yeah. Monopoly 21 checkers and chess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Fred Blassie in a breakfast mess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's play Twister, let's play Risk. Yeah, 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 yeah.
be losing touch If you believe They put a man on the moon Man on the moon If you believe There's nothing up my sleeve Then nothing's cool Scroll Scroll Come on Moses was walking with the staff of wood. Yeah, 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 yeah. Newton got beamed by the apple gun. Yeah, 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 yeah. Egypt was troubled by the horrible last. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Charles Darwin had the gall to ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, Andy, did you hear about this one? Tell me, are you locked in the punch? Well, Andy, are you goofing on Elvis? Hey, baby, are we having fun? If you believe they put a man on the moon, a man on the moon. bunch of um, instrumental parts um yeah get a get a drink maybe a snack okay all right ready okay here's a little lagged for the never believer yeah 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 here's a little ghost for the offering yeah 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 Here's a truck stop instead of St. Peter's. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Andy's coffin. Mr. Andy coffin's gone wrestling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Andy, did you hear about this one? Andy, are you locked in the punch? Andy, are you <laughs> Are we losing touch? If you believe they put a man on the moon, a man on the moon. If you believe there's nothing up my sleeve, but nothing is cool. If you believe they put a man on the moon.